Welcome to the Milestones in Redness series and our discussion of the early days of vitrectomy as it crossed the border into Canada and the pioneering redness surgeons who learned and trained others on the technique and the new tools available for the junior field of vitrectomy. It's my pleasure today as your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, to introduce Dr. Mandelkorn, who was in 1970, Dr. Robert Mockhammer's first fellow at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. In 1971, Dr. Mockhammer and Dr. Anton Benko, Jean-Marie Perel developed the first vitreous infusion suction cutter, the VISC, one of the first commercially available instruments to remove vitreous during a vitrectomy. This represented a major milestone and Bascom Palmer, its physicians and its retina fellows played major roles in both the development of additional technology, but also the transfer of that technology around the world. It's my pleasure to talk to Dr. Mandelkorn, who after training at Bascom Palmer, returned to Toronto, Canada in 1974 and performed the first vitrectomy in the country. He has remained at the University of Toronto ever since and is a mainstay in retina surgery in all of North America. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Tim. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Mark, I can only imagine what it was like to be Dr. Mockhammer's first fellow. Can we start with you talking a little bit about what that was like for you? It was extremely exciting. I remember the details as if it just happened yesterday. Uh, they were so um, they were so startling and so um, memorable, may I say? Um, uh, I after after get being accepted uh, as his fellow, it was a little bit of a uh, problem because there were no emails in those days. There were no text messages. Uh, and so everything had to be done sort of through word of mouth and by telephone. And uh, one day uh, someone said to me, you better call that guy. We've heard about him, but nobody knows what he's doing. But everyone says it's something big. Just call him and speak to him and see what he says. So I called him. I said, hi, it's... Uh, Dr. Mark Mandelkorn here, and I uh, want to do uh, some retina work. I have a, I, at that time, actually, I'd already been accepted as a clinical fellow in retina, but uh, it was for one year beyond the, the July start. And the reason was that at that time, the, the Vietnam War was going on and uh, the American government had uh, said that um, any returning serviceman who uh, was doing his training had preference uh, in every institution. And so they asked me to step aside. So I had a one year to do something before starting my clinical fellowship. And so I called him and said, this is the year it's going to start in July. And he said, oh, that's great. I really need somebody. Just come. Um, I'll get money for you if you have no money, because I had a small family at that time. Um, we'll manage. I'll speak to the chief, who, of course, was Ed Norton, and we'll figure it out and just come. You have to come. I have so much going on. So that that was the uh, kind of the atmosphere in which I arrived in Miami, uh, July the 1st, 1972, and I uh, came to his uh, lab. Uh, he was in the old Bascom Palmer building, and uh, he said, I'm going to show I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. Uh, I know you're here for two years. The first year is me and the second year is everybody else, but you're going to be with me for two years. Uh, he was always very, you know, very, um, pr very precise and he knew what he wanted and he transmitted it and there was never any gray zone with, with Robert. And he said, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to show you what, what the responsibilities are. And so he took me on uh, sort of a tour. The first tour, the first uh, stop was the animal lab. It's probably difficult to talk about that these days, but in those days, um, he had done a lot of work on experimental retinal detachment in, mon in monkeys, and uh, he had a whole uh, uh, animal lab with uh, squirrel monkeys, owl monkeys, where he was doing all of this research. And he said, he said, I've discovered um, a, uh, some facts in looking at pathology of patients with, of uh, animals with experimental retinal detachment. I see all these pigment cells that are floating in the vitreous. And I don't know what they are, but you're going to work on that. And you're going to come up at the end of your period here, you're going to come up with a, a theory about what those pigment cells are all about. And together we worked on an experimental model and we 
went ahead and published it. And of course, it was pigment epithelial proliferation. So that was number one. I met the animal keepers. I met uh, some of the other people that were working there. The second thing he said is, um, you're going to help help me um, uh, group together all of the clinical cases that I've done. Uh, my first 100 vitrectomies, he said, for example, uh, because I haven't published very much clinical material. It's almost all experimental. Uh, so you're going to be the guy who's going to do that. And the third thing he said is that I have a real mission, and he felt very idealistic about this. I have a real mission to transfer this knowledge around the world, not, not only in the United States, but around the world and from the beginning. Uh, I want to make sure that people in Europe and people in South America and so on know how to do it. And I'm glad you're here from Canada because this expands the universe in a, in a sense. So you, you and I are going to work on uh, seminars, on uh, presentations at the Gonas Society, for example, uh, on something that I have in mind. He said, I love to ski and I'm thinking about a veil uh, seminar in, in, by invitation only. You're going to help me with all of that. And then in I think it was in March 1973. I mean, he was talking to me in June, but or July. But he said in March 73, there's going to be the first international vitrectomy meeting, and there are going to be five or six hundred people in San Francisco. Uh, you're going to have to work on that with me. So that was this, this was my introduction to Robert. <laughs> Robert was a big person to be introduced to, so that's really not not surprising. We all think of Dr. Mark Moore as sort of a genius in our field, um, and a little bit intimidating also. When you were there, were there other retina fellows at the institution at the same time? And did you get to have time with them? And, and what role did they play? So well, there, there were the usual clinical uh, retina fellows. Um, at, and I know them all. Uh, Ron Michaels, we were good tennis partners. He was a great tennis player. It's very sad that he had a sh very short life. Bill Hutton from Dallas. Um, and um, who was the other one? Oh, yes. Bruce Haddon from, I think, New Zealand. So they were the three clinical retina fellows. They had, they, at that time, I think they rotated through vitrectomy, but Robert was not giving any cases away at all. He was still struggling with instruments breaking down. So he was, they did a little bit, but hardly any. I was with him on almost all of his cases. Um, so those are the three that were ahead of me, a year ahead of me as clinical fellows. And the year that I transferred into the clinical part of it, uh, I was with Dwayne Fuller, who's rem remained a, a friend. And um, uh, who was the other one? Rolando Chanis, I think. And there was some other one. I forget who it was. Uh, but there was no one else doing any kind of vitrectomy stuff with Macamer except as part of their rotation. And you were there at a unique time for the institution also. I mean, Dr. Gass was there at the, at the moment and Dr. Curden was there. And of course, you had the chief. So did you appreciate how remarkable the faculty at Bascom Palmer was at that time? Absolutely. I mean, not, you named a couple, but uh, think about Lawton Smith, for example, uh, entertainment and uh, education simultaneously. I mean, he was just fabulous. And some of his expressions, uh, not being, a, you know, no light perception for Lawton Smith was not lo no light perception. It was uh, seeing the difference between uh, midnight in a coal mine and an atomic flash. Right. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> Uh, he was uh, he was there. Of course, the rounds were uh, wonderful rounds. They were just, I mean, they're incomparable. Um, there was uh, Doug Anderson, who was doing his work on electron microscopy of the optic nerve in glaucoma, and Dick Forster on all the corneal infections, the wild and weird things that he, he found. And, uh, um, of course, the retina people. But Don Gass was definitely a highlight, but they were all kings. They were all kings of their area. John Flynn. My wife is a clinical is a psychologist who had done a lot of work on learning disabilities, and John Flynn was getting involved in learning disabilities in relation to ocular things, and uh, so they, they, we were sort of talking all the time about those things. Yeah, it, it just seems remarkable to understand that at one point a lot of the field of retina was concentrated in a very few institutions and that those institutions were able to seed across the, the country and across the world. So tell me a little bit about what it was like to take vitrectomy from Miami into Canada. How, how did you feel about doing that? What were your concerns? Um, was it exciting? Was it terrifying? All of that, all of the above, I think. I had a, a very good men mentor from uh, Dr. McAmer. He knew how, first of all, he was a very good lecturer. He understood 
pathology and, and physiology, and he could explain himself in very simple terms. Um, he did terrific uh, lectures. His uh, slides were always wonderful. So I had that model and I carried that with me. That was number one. Number two, he, uh, he was very idealistic about passing on the information and I felt, uh, I felt um, a moral obligation to do the same from my own situation in Canada. So uh, one of the first things I realized when I went back to Canada um, is that the only people who are going to get vitrectomy training are the young fellows. They're going to have a retina fellowship somewhere and they're going to come out and that's going to take years and years. In the meantime, we have all these very well-trained retina people out there around the world who would love to spend a week, a month, maybe two months uh, picking things up quickly, as we know people can do uh, with, with other exper related experience. And so I devised this um, uh, open fellowship uh, which many, many people from around the world, from Turkey and Saudi Arabia and uh, Greece and uh, United States and England, um, and they uh, would contact me and they'd say, I'd like to come and spend two weeks with you or I'd like to come and spend a month with you. Is that possible? And I said, I will make it possible. And so over the years, I must have trained 50 or more uh, people from that were all retina surgeons from elsewhere uh, and just in a short period of time they could see what it was like and uh, what some of the problems were they certainly saw those um, and when they went back to their own places they introduced vitrectomy immediately no one had to wait for a, a one-year or two-year fellowship to get the benefit of that and I attribute that to Robert's foresight in instilling in, in me and the other people as well this uh, this important function of transmitting the information as quickly as possible. So um, I did set, set up um, these fellowships. Uh, from Don Gass, I should add, uh, I did learn the, um, the utility of macular conferences, uh, as you, you probably don't know, but, but, but these, these were big things in, in uh, they, they were on Tuesday afternoons for two or three hours, I think. And uh, he would just hold forth and challenge everybody. And then he would give his, his interpretation of the slides. And so I instituted um, a macular case conference uh, when I came back every Friday. Initially, just the residents uh, showed up, but within a week or two, the whole staff showed up. And then uh, after a month or two, it was standing room only. We had to get a bigger room because everyone wanted to tap in to someone who had learned from Don Gass. And uh, so that went on for a long, long time. I would say years and years until um, you know other people started to take over. So uh, that was that. I should say a word about Don Gass, by the way, because uh, that was also exciting. After Macomer took me around and showed me everything, uh, he bumped into Don Gass and uh, he said, this is the new fellow, Mark Mandelkorn. He's from Canada. And Don Gass said, uh, I'm born in Canada. So he said, that's why I have an accent. Um, <laughs> anyway, he was born actually in Nova Scotia and he, he left around the age of two years. He said, oh, you're a Canadian. Well, I know Canadians are very hard workers. Come on with me. I have something that I want you to do. Okay, so I had this whole uh, series of directives from Robert. And at the same time, Don Gass said, come on inside. So he showed me a room uh, which had these flat top tables uh, stacked with fluorescein files. There must have been hundreds and hundreds of them. And he said, Mark, um, I haven't had a chance to report on these. Some of them are about six months old. Some of them are a year old. I really have to report on them. Would you mind reporting on them for me? And if you have any problem, let's say at the end of the, just do 10 or 15 a day, whatever number you can do, any problem with any case, uh, just let me know. And I'll come in at the end of the day at five o'clock and we'll go over those cases. What could be better than a, uh, you know, a one-on-one -on -one with Don Gass in his major field of specialty. So I learned so much from Don Gass in, in that, uh, in, in doing that for him. And, uh, you know, we became pretty, he's such a chummy guy. He was such a chummy guy. Everybody loved him. And uh, so that, that was the Don Gass uh, experience. Yeah, so when I came to Bascom Palmer, I felt so much like that. You know, it was amazing how uh, interactive the discourse was and, and faculty members could dis disagree with each other vehemently, but they were so respectful of the other's opinion. Um, I found it an incredible time to continue to learn also. It's, it seems a little, it seems that our educational system has changed a little bit. It's hard to have those kind of um, civil disagreements as we try to push our field forward. 
I think that I think you you know had the opportunity to be with two incredibly remarkable people who really emulate what training was was about at the time. Now you're going to a new hospital. You're still sort of the junior guy. You're bringing in new technology. What kind of support did the hospital bring to you? Did they cover your costs? Were they were they enthusiastic about doing this? You know, was this something you had to shoestring on your own budget? How, how did you make that happen? Uh, I had to set up everything. There, the, there was only one retina-trained person in Toronto at that time. That was Michael Shea. He was a Skepins-trained uh, scleral buckle person. Uh, he didn't have any other uh, tr other experience in, certainly not in metrectomy, certainly not in macular disease. So everything had to be uh, set up from scratch. There was no microscope. Uh, there was no ultrasound. Uh, there was no laser. There was no ERG. There was nothing. Um, when I left Miami, Jean-Marie said, Mark, he said, uh, take two of my uh, VISC-10 apparatuses. Just put them in your car, take them to Toronto, and then you've, you've got a setup. All you need now is a microscope, okay? So um, because I had worked with Robert uh, with Zeiss uh, many, many times in, uh, up, in upgrading the microscope, you may, may know that uh, when I got to Miami in 72, they did not have any... Um, um, fiber optic illumination. They had a slit lamp which was mounted on the microscope and it, it moved, moved in an arc like we do on the table. And so Zeiss had to build all these things and they had to decide whether they were going to go forward and do this commercially or not. So there were a lot of discussions and they would Zeiss people would come into Robert's office and I would be there and then so I got to know them. So when I got back to Toronto, I called up some of the names that I knew. Most of them were uh, in New York, um, but I called them up and said, I'm here in Toronto. Um, I need a microscope. I want an up-to-date microscope uh, and so on and so forth. So I was able to use those contacts that I had made through, my, through Robert uh, to get set up. Um, the hospital, uh, all the budgets in our hospitals come from the government. So the government, I think, recognized that there was a need for uh, at least one more retina surgeon in a population of about 5 million people. And um, so they, uh, I guess they funded the hospital. I never really had to think about it. It was just there. I need this microscope and it costs so much uh, and, and so on. I think another big thing that happened is my first case, uh, which was in September 1974, uh, I just come back and I had established everything. The microscope was working. I actually set up an ERG lab. Uh, Steve Charles was my mentor in that area. People don't know that he, he started out with electrophysiology. Um, so uh, all that was set up and I was ready to go. And um, there, because Robert had uh, worked on um, some uh, patient soldiers that had been injured in the 1973 um, war, uh, the War of Atonement, um, uh, a lot of people from the Middle East knew my name also, and so they started sending patients directly to me. So the first patient that came was a diabetic patient uh, who had not had a vitreous hemorrhage, um, non-resolved for 40 years. <laughs> uh, he had a daughter that he, they had almost not seen a, as an adult, and he had a grandchild, and uh, he, he was sent over. It was my first case. And I thought, you're not going to screw up on this one. You better, <laughs> you better get it done properly. So this, this uh, fellow was operated on. And the day after surgery, he took off the bandage, very worried that he was going to have a re-bleed. But no, took off the bandage. And he, can, he said in his own language, I can see, I can see, Sarah, come over here. I can see. It was the most amazing thing. And so uh, the hospital arranged a, uh, a press conference to announce that in this hospital, we have this person who's trained and is going to be doing these operations. And so at the press conference, uh, the, the newspapers came with cameras and everything, and they had the patient uh, who was interviewed also and through a, an interpreter. And he explained he, he hadn't seen his, his daughter, his grandchild. In fact, he had never seen in those days a digital watch. In that 40 years, digital watches had come in. We don't use them anymore. But so, so many things, he, he was like a Rip Van Winkle um, moment for him. After the press conference, I was inundated with requests from donors in the hospital to donate to the establishment of a electrophysiology lab, the establishment of a fluorescein angiography unit, and, and so on and so forth. And then the money just rolled in from uh, donors. So it was very good marketing on the part of the hospital. 
Well, and you saved the day with a great first case. So, you know, those oh, are those, exactly. those, are those <laughs> pivotal moments where things can be wonderful or maybe not so wonderful. Exactly. You also mentioned an unsung hero in, in all of this at Bascom Palmer, who was Jean-Marie Perel. You know, right. I think some of my younger, you know, colleagues really don't appreciate what role that, that Jean-Marie played. But you must have spent some significant time with Jean-Marie during that time with Mockamer. Well, I, I, I didn't get to the whole list of things that Robert showed me around, but uh, number two certainly was Jean-Marie. Went into his lab, I think his uh, design lab, it was in the old library uh, at the old building, and he had diagrams everywhere, diagrams and measurements and uh, lasers and all kinds of bench work, and uh, he was more than anxious to, to impart what he had learned about all of these things, and he was constantly, constantly uh, refining and perfecting and uh, working with Robert. Uh, every time there was a problem, uh, Jean-Marie was there, there and they worked out what is the detail. They'd go down to the machine shop and they'd say to, to Willy Almeyer, grind it down 0 0.0001 millimeters less, you know, because it's getting stuck and that sort of thing. So Jean-Marie was an equal partner with Robert in developing this whole system. Plus a remarkable man. I mean, when I opened my lab at Bascom Palmer, Jean-Marie was, was just remarkably helpful and always willing to have his door open. And it didn't matter if you were the first, you know, your faculty member or if you were a, a medical student, I was always impressed. And then of course, having Steve Charles with you, you know, really some remarkable overlaps in your early career with some of the people that were really legendary and, and still are. So right. um, tell me this. One of the things I talk to the fellows about is, is really know your equipment and be able to troubleshoot it. I don't think fellows understand the days of setting up your own equipment, which required full assembly. So right. what, was, what was that like? Do you, how, do you, how do you impart that to fellows that, that you're with now? Uh, I Well, everybody knows that if something is broken in the operating room, they call me, even to this day. So I go upstairs and I troubleshoot whatever I can, and uh, usually I can figure out what's what's going on. So I learned that from the experience. I was There was a uh, one of the um, instrument companies um, that make vitrectomy instruments was around showing us uh, one of the Ingenuity uh, uh, updates. And um, so we started talking and uh, he said, Dr. Mandelkorn, what uh, suction setting do you use on your on your machine? And I said, you know, I, I don't know what I said, some number, maybe 100, 200. He said, you have a really light foot because people are are using 2000. And, and I said, you know, I, uh, the problem is that they have never been in an eye when all the instruments break down. So you have to be extremely careful. So that's what I impart to my to the fellows. Just don't rely on your instruments because things are going to happen. It may not happen for the first 100 cases, but it's going to happen. And if you if you are too cavalier about what you're doing, and uh, you're going to have to, and it may happen at night, and there's nobody around that can fix it. So just watch what I do. Try to understand the mechanisms. Maybe you can figure it out. So uh, you're, I'm just in, I'm in the same uh, school of um, hard knocks as as you are. I think. Uh, it's a very important skill for, for them to acquire. Now, when Jean-Marie sent you off with the VISCs to, to, to begin the vitrectomy service in Canada, I think he wrote a letter to you around that same time too. Is that correct? Several letters. The two sets that he sent, that he sent me with, they were not commercially available. They were prototypes. And uh, so if they broke down, there was nowhere to get them fixed. So I, I had constant communication with Jean-Marie about can I fix it myself? Do I have to ship it down? And so on. So we had letters back and forth. And I think um, I have I have one letter that uh, there was, uh, he had to, I can read it for you if you'd sure. like. Why don't you read okay. it for us? I'll read, okay, I'll read it for you. You'll see what it says here. Dear, dear Mark, as you requested, what you should be doing is use the new one millimeter diameter cutter, connect the female to female adapter to the backup line, assemblies uh, infusion line, blue color and connect the ladder to the aspiration or suction system. This is like putting together a, a cabinet from, from uh, Ikea. <laughs> Ikea. Yeah, uh, the red back cap fitting is not used in this case. The one millimeter cutter was designed to pediatric cases where infusion is provided and so on. The one millimeter cutter can be used for three port and so on and so forth, the 2.2. That's the, this is the, uh, the flavor of his, 
of his letters. And then it says the enclosed VISC-10 system has been fully tested and it's ready for use. So that's the guarantee. Uh, so we, we communicated quite a bit and I did go down to Miami uh, many, many times over the years and always uh, paid him a visit. Um, and uh, we always sort of uh, reminisced about uh, the, the good old days as we're doing today. Um, so he's, he is a great, great guy. So the tray that's to your left, is, is, is that our VISC? This is it. Yeah, this is our. This is uh, one of his visks. This is his personal visk. And when he when he gave it to me, he said this has never been used on patients. It's just a prototype that he put together uh, with all of the uh, the little components and so on and so forth. Take off the top and reassemble this uh, whole set. Uh, the key is this motor, which is a shaving motor. I uh, just show it to the fellows because when they when they come in and they see everything is all self-contained and there's a big black box and they don't know what what goes where and how it's working, I show I say this is the way it used to be. So this is what we would have to um, autoclave between cases. So I we would put it together, uh, wrap it in this format and then put it in the autoclave for five minutes between cases, let it um, cool off and then start the next case. So the between cases would be about 45 minutes uh, until we actually got going. One of the things that's always impressed me, and, and I have a, a love of new instrumentation as you do, is that the new instruments come sometimes with exciting moments in the operating room um, where things don't always go quite as expected. Could you give us a couple of examples that um, really are vivid for you when that might've happened? Um, if, you know, in all honesty, I haven't had any of those, I mean, any of those moments, uh, uh, I had learned enough to uh, extricate myself before it got too far. Uh, I really can't offhand. I can't, I, I remember one case that I, uh, one case of a giant tear that I was operating on lying on my back. Uh, the patient was on a striker bed, uh, rotated over and, uh, I couldn't stand up for the next week, <laughs> but uh, that's about the old, but that was not anything to do with the actual instrumentation. It was just uh, the situation, but no, um, I really have, didn't have any, um, you know, it gets, the, the cutter would get stuck sometimes, but I had all the Robert's um, um, expressions were constantly in my mind. You know, t you can't keep eating. You have to take a drink. Um, <laughs> you know, you can't, uh, uh, don't go too close to the vitreous base. I mean, he, he would say things that would be either metaphorical uh, or they would be actually very explicit, uh, you know, literal. Um, and uh, those, I still hear those words in, in my mind uh, when, when I start to see I might get into trouble here. I don't say what would Robert do, but, uh, but I know what he would do because my thinking became like his thinking. It, it, I find that fascinating that, that we pass on to our fellows and we incorporate into our own, you know, surgical approaches so much of what we were trained with. So I still hear, you know, Gary Abrams making comments in my mind as I'm doing something now 30 years later. So it's striking. And I think we pass that on to our fellows and they pass that on to their fellows. So there's such a history uh, that's so rich with the uh, one-on-one -on -one sort of, you know, realistically ingrained training. It's, it's, I'm a big believer that, you know, you can read about things, but until you do it, until it's in your hands, that, that it really doesn't translate um, to a true understanding. So did you get to do any vitrectomy cases with, clinically with, with Robert at Bascom Palmer, and how many were you able to do? Zero. Zero. So, I learned you know, it all by watching. So it's amazing because, you know, the fellows that we get now wouldn't don't even consider a program that they don't get to operate in as a primary surgeon. And I remember when I was at Hopkins and, and Ron Michaels was was trying to have me stay. You know, Ron was very much like like Dr. Mockamer. He was about you watch me. And that's how you'll learn. And then you go on to be the chief resident and you, you'll do your cases then. Um, how do you feel about that now, decades later? Well, just to, um, to um, bring back the, uh, the story of my first patient, September 1974, I had never done a vitrectomy. And he showed up on my doorstep to have a vitrectomy uh, to save his, 
his, his sight to save his life. So um, I obviously, uh, being an assistant with someone who really knows what he's doing is a very beneficial activity. It's not necessary to keep getting into trouble and learning from trouble. You should be learning from, you know, care, caution, um, thinking. Uh, most of the surgery is judgment. It's not actually uh, manual dexterity, as you know, as we all know. So, uh, but if you try to say that to the fellows, that they're they're not receptive to that. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think, I, I I think that's interesting because I think you and I would agree sometimes that how you think about a surgical procedure is as important, if not more so, than actually what you what you manually do in the procedure itself. So, so um, that must have you know you have remarkable surgical abilities to take your first case for your first vitrectomy without having ever done a vitrectomy. I, I find that kind of um, terrifying and intimidating and exhilarating all at the same time. Uh, it was all of that. It was all of that. <laughs> it took me, I think, four hours to do that vitrectomy. I think nowadays I could do it in ten minutes. Um, but uh, it, it, I was so careful. And of course, the blood was really thick. I can still see it, actually. Um, and uh, so I had to be careful and drink a lot of, take a lot of drinks with the, uh, with the cutter. Um, but uh, it, well, it, it was. But, you know, on the other hand, you have to get, you have to start somewhere. And if you, if you, your first case on some shrapnel or some glass intraocular foreign body, things that are very, very difficult. That's your first case. You know you're going to have problems. So just use first principles and keep those little memories in mind and uh, do, do your best. And that's all anyone can ask of you. And, and, you know, it's interesting because you were right there at the beginning, but our field has changed so much from an instrument perspective over, you know, the last four decades. Um, what do you think has been the, the major moments that, that you feel have really pivotally changed our field in the um, OR? Well, I think overall, the, the biggest thing that's changed is the reliability of the instruments. That's the biggest thing. Uh, without that reliability, um, we would, it would not be fun at all. It's, it's just fun. Um, I think there was a big, um, a big turning point um, when the retina community adopted uh, multifunction instrumentation as opposed to uh, uni function. Robert uh, was very adamant that a 14 gauge entry with fiber optic sleeve over um, over a uh, an 18 gauge cutter um, would was the best way to go so that you freed your second hand for a scissors or, or something else. And um, when the um, Conor O'Malley group um, and Cooper Vision uh, came forward with the multifunction probe. Robert was really against it. And Robert said, you can't do that because we're not going to be able to get any spare parts for our uni function, uni, uh, you know, un one single instrument. And they said, no, we promise you, don't worry. We know we're Cooper and we're multifunction, but we're going to make sure there's a division that will supply your needs. And so Robert said, okay, that's fine. Watch what happens. And within a two or three months, they, there were no more spare parts available. So that was a big, a big turning point. Uh, the other big turning point was the wide angle viewing. Um, where now it's all automated, uh, or not automated, but at least uh, foot pedal controlled. Uh, that, that's been great. And I think the third big thing is the, um, the fluids that we use, the, whether it's uh, heavy oil or light oil uh, or uh, gases uh, and that sort of thing. So I'm using a lot of uh, silicone oil, a lot of Denseron, which I don't think you're, you're able to have, but that's uh, extremely, extremely good. And um, of course, all the gases. Those are the big three moments, I think. Yeah, I still look back to, you know, I did my first giant retinal tears also like you on a striker table, looking up, having fluids drip down and um, being, you know, just physically, you know, destroyed through the case. And the first time I used a perfluorocarbon liquid, I was like, never going to go back. So amazing. And at the time, you know, when you got oils in and some of the perfluorocarbon liquids, in a way you were almost smuggling them in compared to what, what we're required to do today. Is that correct? That's right, actually. Silicone, I had heard about silicone oil. I don't think Robert ever used it when I was there in Miami, but uh, we heard uh, John Scott, I think, in, at Oxford was using silicone oil, and there were a number of other people um, that were using silicone oil, and so I knew it was around. 
I don't remember him ever that he ever used it. But uh, so I came back and I realized I had some cases that needed it, but it was not you couldn't buy it anywhere. It was illegal. Um, but my wife's first cousin was a chemical engineer and uh, he worked for um, a chemical company called CIL, Chemical Industries Limited or something. It's a huge multinational corporation. And uh, he was uh, one of the engineering people. So I said, can you get me some silicone oil? He said, I'll try. Uh, and he said, well, okay, I'll look into it. And then he came back and he said, there are two grades. There is industrial grade and instrument grade. And I said, what's the difference? He said, the instrument grade is 99.999% pure. And the industrial grade is 99.1% pure. I said, okay, you better be the in instrument grade. Then I contacted the, um, the government department for, it, for uh, devices and uh, medications. And uh, they said to me, there's no rule against using anything that you as a physician uh, think is necessary to use in order to benefit this particular patient. So I said, okay, I want to use silicone oil. I'm going to get the best oil that I can find, which is the, and, uh, the um, instrument grade. What should I do to make sure to ensure that I'm not doing something harmful? And they said, well, our rules are you have to do a uh, search on um, heavy metal inclusion and you have to do bacteriology. So we did both those things and my, the can that I had, um, we took a little droplet uh, uh, to do the analyses and uh, it was negative on both. And that's how I started using silicone oil. Amazing, really amazing. And even to this day, I don't know if it's legal, but it, it's accepted right, in that's... Canada. It's it's interesting. Um, well, Dr. Mandelkorn, you, you know you've you've lived the history of vitrectomy, and you've you've lived it through the advances. You were there at the beginning. You took vitrectomy from Bascom Palmer into Canada. You've you've trained, um, you know, a legion of of retina specialists. I also want to thank you for for your son, who is our next generation retina specialist. I've had the opportunity to have. Uh, to listen to Efren at the Vitrectomy and Buckle Society and at ASRS. So um, I feel like you've passed the legacy down in, in a remarkable way. So I want to thank you for joining us and sharing with us. And um, what an incredible career. And I'm very pleased that you're still in the operating room and you're still taking care of patients and you're still sharing your knowledge. So Dr. Mandelkorn, thank you for being with us on Milestones and Retina. It's my great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you.